I've been spending a lot of time in the last couple of weeks going through files I have of the last decades of my life, sort of circling around slowly around a book I want to write, which is a lot more about the chronology of the building of Ananda. And it's, I'm, I'm looking at things that I lived through. I'm not reading a history that I wasn't part of. Um, my notes are very unsystematic, so I just have a, a glimpse here and a glimpse there, something that struck me, I wrote down. Uh, and it's been fascinating because the combination of all of these elements together, which is that I was actually there, so I had an impression in real time of Swamiji's personality and what he was doing. Um, Now I have the perspective of all the years that have passed and the pattern that emerged from what he did when you were on this side of it, you didn't know where it was going. But from this side of it, you could see what the pattern was. And of course, the last part of that is just, I'm a lot older now. And I have had, uh, in my own tiny way, you know, more experience that matches his than I did, of course, at that time when I was just, well, young. We'll just leave it there. Beginning, inexperienced is the word that we want. Because there's really no such thing as age. And the quality of Swami's consciousness is the essence of what it means to be a disciple. And that's what we always celebrate this day. This is our disciple, our discipleship anniversary. In many ways, in ashrams, we only celebrate the Guru's birthday. Of course, we're not strict like that. And in many ways, this is all of our discipleship anniversary. Or more accurately, this is the day Ananda started the whole story that we've been living started today. And so it's really our spiritual birthday in the best possible sense. Swamiji was 22 on this day in 1948. Um, Spiritually speaking, there is no age. But he was an extremely vital, um, you know, highly strung, you might even say, utterly intense, with all the, the, the power of youth and the ambition um, of, a, of a high intelligence and a refined nature um, to, to, to make something happen, whether that was going to be to change the world or to change himself, there was so much power concentrated there. And Master, of course, with his own super consciousness, could look right at this young man in front of him and know exactly who he had. And of course, Swamiji could look at Master, and not by real understanding necessarily, except on the soul, but by pure intuition. He knew what he had. He recognized him. He recognized him as that infallible thread of light that would extricate Swamiji, from everything that bound him. And that's really how we have to think of the Master. We are bound in so many ways that we don't even know. That's the humor of it. When uh, one of the stories in the Book of Miracles that I published is this woman who was having an operation. And during the operation, she went out of her body. And when she was out of her body, she suddenly realized how absolutely confined she had always been. She was never conscious of being crushed by her identification with her physical body. But when released from it for just a moment, she was, she was suddenly aware of this enormous freedom And the the operation had to do with an injury to her knee, and they were putting it in a cast or something like that. And when she came back into her body, she kept saying, it's too tight, it's too tight, it's too tight. 
And all the doctors were trying to adjust the cast on her leg and she couldn't communicate to them that what was too tight was the whole identification with being a physical being that she had temporarily been freed from. And she was conscious of the fact that because she was breathing, she was now trapped in her body again. So she kept trying not to breathe. So the surgeons are trying to fix her cast and force her to breathe. And she's trying so hard not to breathe and they're all struggling together and nobody has any idea how completely misunderstood the other one was. Well, I think a lot of us just going through this world were so profoundly misunderstood and we misunderstand. I know some of you have shared what I felt was just my confusion growing up. I was always just a little mixed up as to what was actually going on around me. I couldn't quite figure out how people became friends. I couldn't figure out why they became friends. I couldn't figure out what they were talking about. It was just all like I, I participated, but always with this feeling as if from behind glass. And Swamiji talked about for most of his life in social situations that were not devotees, he always thought in some fundamental way he was missing the point because he could never see where it was going. And then out of all of that, you see, the guru hears your heart. And it's about what we think with our minds and all the ways in which we get ready. But really what the guru is hearing is he's hearing that call of the heart. And we have this moment when we suddenly know that we're actually going to be rescued. That where we are is not where we're going to have to stay forever. That there is, in fact, a pathway, a highway that will take us to our divine goal. And Swamiji's life was mostly acted out, I think, for the benefit of others. But there was an element of his own destiny that he had to live through. And so he showed us what it takes. And he talked about how, just on this time when he met autobiography, found autobiography of a yogi, how absolutely desperate he was. And he had decided that he was going to give up everything, remember? Go out on a ship, earn money, and then use the money he earned to go off into the jungles of South America, just all by himself to meditate. He didn't know how to meditate. He didn't know where he would live. He didn't know how any of that would work. But anything was better than just continuing down the road of worldly life that was laid out in front of him. Now, into that fertile soil, the guru can drop the seed of self-realization. And that was the fertile soil that Master found when Swami knelt in front of him. I want to be your disciple. And Swamiji also, he's, he helps us when he writes that story. I never imagined that I would say those words to anyone. You know, Swamiji, as we all knew him, was an extremely strong-minded person. And he himself, when speaking, for example, of SRF's decision to expel him, he did admit that he, was, he, he can be a little frustrating to people because he won't argue with them, but if he doesn't agree, nor will he change. Nor will he just go along because others want him to go along. He'll just quietly but stubbornly and with great determination stick to the truth as he sees it. You know, many, many lifetimes of developed intuition that give him that which is not then foolishness. But when he was in the presence of the Master, he realized that everything that he was was just literally of no consequence. And it, it's very important for us Really, Swamiji told us the same stories over and over again. 
it's very important for us also to really feel in our hearts, I want to be your disciple. And it's interesting you see that Swamiji put it that way. He didn't say, will you be my guru? And that's Master's first line in Autobiography of a Yogi. He speaks of the disciple-guru relationship. Because Master could be anybody's guru. Because Master was fully self-realized. He could be anybody's guru. So it isn't a question of whether he can be the guru. It's a question of whether we really want to be disciples. And then how finely are we going to attune ourselves to that reality? And Swamiji was honest about his process in that respect. And from time to time, although rarely, when he wandered away even a little bit from what he came to understand on the most subtle level was that um, vibration of Master's Ray. At a certain point, Swamiji tried to get us to understand what it is we're attuned to. He called it the ray of this line of masters, as, you know, coming down like from the sunlight, a particular ray. And there's many different spiritual paths, there's many ways to get to God, depending on who you are. But what we're trying to do is we're trying to move over until we're standing in what is actually a very narrow um, space in, in our consciousness where we know exactly to whom we belong and we know what that commitment means. Jyotish sent out a letter this morning and he talked about how very creative Swamiji was and at the same time he was extremely orthodox. And that's really, I think, the essence of discipleship for us on this path and discipleship for this age. We can be very creative because that vibration that we're in tune with is literally an expression of Om. And Om can go and take any form it wants to take. We can be very, very creative as long as we're orthodox in the sense of saying, Why am I doing this? What is my purpose? And how does this align with your ray? How does this serve your cause? How does this express your consciousness? Someone was asking me a couple of days ago about the place of loyalty on the spiritual path. And my answer to him was, first you have to be completely sincere. You can't be loyal just because someone told you you're supposed to be loyal. It can't be fear of punishment that keeps you loyal. You have to be loyal to your particular path because that's where the joy is. And that's what it was for Swamiji. That's where the joy was. And whenever he was even slightly outside of Master's Ray, all the joy went away. He told us, you may remember, a very interesting story of... um, this uh, uh, sadhu he met in India who told him that there were many other higher Kriyas than than Swamiji had ever learned from Master. And Swamiji knew that because his time with Master was so short that maybe he'd never had the opportunity. And this man was in the line of Lahiri Mahashaya, I think. So Swamiji reasoned that, well... You know, if if Master had lived longer, he would have perhaps taught me these things. And so maybe I'm being sent to this man. And so he decided to let this man teach him things about Kriya that Master had never taught him. And it came, though, that in order for this man to teach him, the man also had to initiate him. And again, Swamiji thought, well... This, you know, this all seems like the right thing to do. And he went ahead. And then Swamiji said, six months later, he realized that all the joy had gone out of his life. And all the joy had gone out of his life because he realized that there was this veil between himself and Master. And he realized that it had started when he had looked to that other man to teach him. And... In that moment, he said, he repudiated that initiation and he said, if Master, if I can't learn it directly from Master, 
then obviously I don't need it. And he repudiated that initiation. He said, in that very moment, the joy came back. Isn't that interesting? You know, and that's how, that's the kind of sensitivity we have to build. That's how Swamiji was able to devote 60 more, more than 60 years, because the dynamic joy never left him. And his entire life, Swamiji was always learning new things about Master, things he didn't know, things he hadn't understood until he himself reached a certain level of understanding. Then he could look and he could see and he could understand. Now, interestingly, Swamiji also spent a lot of time with Ananda Ma. He never took initiation or became her disciple. But whenever he was with Ma, he felt closer to Master. And in fact, he, he put it to us this way. He said he'd been too young when he was with Master, because he was 22 to, to 25, 26, that was all. He said he was, he was never able to relax himself. He, was, he put it, he was always in such awe of Master. That he said, but with Ma, she was his mother. And he was able to be very, very free. And he says he felt that uh, with Ma, he had the kind of uh, intimate freedom that he hadn't been mature enough to have with Master. And in a way, it taught him more about how to be Master's disciple. Now, what that's all saying is we have to be in tune inside. We can't just say this will work and that won't. Interestingly, just as a matter of fact, there was a period of time in my spiritual life when somebody made me this little wooden um, medallion and had a picture of Master on one side and had a picture of Ananda Moima on the other side. And I wore my mala all the time and I had that medallion. I wore it for many years. And then I began to feel just this slight, something was a little wrong. And I, I picked it up and I looked at that picture of Ma and I suddenly felt she's not my guru. And it's not right that I should be holding her in my heart this way. Not that, not that that has anything to do with her, but my clarity was not so strong that it could be tampered with. So I took it off of my mala and I gave it to someone else who would appreciate it. And as soon as I did that, I felt at peace again. You know, every little step that we take, and we don't get there quickly and we don't get there without mistakes. But what Swamiji's life tells us is that it is the path we want to walk. You know, when he called it the new path, it's the path of discipleship. It's the path of complete humility. And complete humility, as Master defined it, It's not self-abnegation. It's not saying that I'm nothing. It's just being completely realistic about who we are. We are dedicated. We are sincere. We are energetic. We have many fine things going for us. But compared to infinity, we're just hardly a drop of water. And when we become disciples, everything is compared to infinity. And that's the great uh, fun of it. I was talking again to a young man who was very, very new. And I was telling him the fact that when I started on this path, I'm a very quick study. And I didn't know if my career at Ananda would be 12 months or 6 months or 3 days, what it would be. But the great joy of this path, you see, is that it's compared to infinity. And so even though we can watch ourselves transform and then transform and then transform again and again and again so that every few years we look back and think, what a child I was and now finally I have a clue. And then a few years more pass and we have exactly the same experience. Because, you see, we're compared to infinity. The image of ourselves and the only one worth carrying is our just walking into the light. And if we're not there yet, we have to pay attention to the road. Very, very, very careful attention to the road. 
The fun of Master's Path is the more you study it, the more you learn. It's just the more you read the same books over and over again, there's nuances there. And I was starting to say, let me just touch this for a minute before I stop. You know, I've always had tremendous reverence for Swami, which increases rather than decreases as time passes. And looking back at his actions when he was in his 40s and I was in my 20s, and just watching him move forward, I know he had an expanded vision of where we were going. And he also had what he called, he had a gift for seeing how certain decisions would play out in the future. So he could always guide things. He, even when others didn't realize that we were going off course, he would know it and pull things back. But what I, I see when I look at him now even more than when I was living with him was he had simply an unrelenting commitment to be master's instrument in the world. And he had ups and downs of, you know, things would work out, things wouldn't, people would attack him, his close friends betrayed him, some things worked out, some didn't, you know, he had his various struggles, whatever they might have been. But underneath it was this just power, just this enormous power of a soul that understands there is no choice. I have found the man to whom I said, I want to be your disciple. When he accepted me, there is no turning back. In Swamiji's last book, Love Perfected, Life Divine, the heroine has to go through many dramatic tests. And the last test has her literally just walking into fire, just having the faith to just walk into fire, and then, of course, having that shift into another transformation. But in that story, the heroine just, there is no way to get where she wants to go, except right through that fire. And she simply counts it as nothing. She just walks into it. And that's, I think, how Swami's whole life was. He found autobiography. He knelt in front of Master. I want to be your disciple. Master accepted him as a disciple. Blessed him. And that was it. Everything that came after, it didn't matter because... On the other side of it was an incarnation in which Swamiji was able to say, I have been a good disciple. All of our incarnations, all of our longing, all of our hopes, dreams, regrets, everything, it's all resolved. I will be a good disciple.